This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Sonny Agarwal. Hey, Sonny, how are you recovering from uh, ETC last week? I'm getting there. Uh, you know, the Swiss uh, Alps are def in, out my window definitely help. Okay, good. So you're, you're in Switzerland at the moment? I am in Switzerland at the moment and, you know, just uh, had a good, great time in Paris last week with uh, ETCC and then uh, I, I was judging at ETH Paris, so that went also really well. Saw some cool projects come out of there. So, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was good. I mean, I was really sick. Like, I went on vacation and then I, I got this really bad stomach bug. Um, so, I didn't see many of the talks, unfortunately. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, there were a lot of people there and... So uh, what, what were your impressions, uh, uh, like global, you know, generally about ETC this year? Just in general, uh, ETC is probably my favorite conference, uh, just because I don't know, it's just something about the vibe at ETC. Both years that I've been, so I've been two years in a row now. Both years was just always like, you know, it just had this great community feel to it. It felt. It, it just didn't feel as formal or uptight as like certain other conferences and. Um, you know, an example of it, like, you know, I remember uh, last year, uh, Rick Dudley gave, went up and gave a talk titled Things I Don't Like About Ethereum. And he just stood there for 30 minutes and ranted about, like, everything he dislikes about Ethereum. And it's like, you just couldn't have that kind of content at something like DevCon, for example, right? It's like a very different feel there, much more community oriented. And, uh, and every year at, 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 at ETCC, both years, there's always been like governance drama, which is always, uh, you know, makes it much more exciting and fun. The hallway conversations become a lot more fun that way. Yeah, I, I was there. I wasn't there last year. I went to the one two years ago, which I guess wasn't ETC. It was kind of the precursor to ETC. But it 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 did feel like it felt like a big meetup, really, to me. It's, right. And I, I, one of the talks I did go to was uh, about um, the Ethereum 1.x roadmap, which is something we've covered recently with Alexei. And and it was in, so the the venue is actually quite nice. The venue is the CNAM in Paris, which is this really nice. Uh, uh, it's like uh, this higher education um, uh, center. So uh, it's old buildings and uh, and so the, the, these big amphitheaters, kind of like university style amphitheaters. And the 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 speaker at some point. I mean, I don't want to say he lost control of the room, but the discussion was just like happening in the room, and people were on the sidelines. And then, you know, the 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 poor girl who had to go around because they're live streaming everything, and the poor girl who had the mic <laughs> was like basically just running all over the place trying to get the mic to people so that everybody who was watching the live stream could see. Um, so yeah, it really does really have like you say this community feel, and um, yeah, I hope it continues. Um, and so we obviously thing, had our own little personal meetup there as well. Yeah, so, so we, uh, despite my, my sickness, uh, uh, we had a small meetup uh, at a bar close by, like maybe 20 people came. Um, we were competing against lots of other events. So to those who came, thank you. Uh, you are true Epicenter fans. Uh, you didn't go to like the Tezos meetup or some other meetup. You chose to come to our little meetup. And also we were competing with like some big, football game like European football <laughs> game was, was happening which I had no idea um, so thank you to those who came it's great to see everybody and uh, and um, yeah excited to do our next meetup uh, at the next uh, event uh, where we will go to and uh, and you had um, a, a Cosmos SDK workshop which I attended uh, which was also really good uh, and hope you learned so something I did learn something I learned that um I don't know how to code Go, and that I should probably learn a bit more uh, Go. But I had to leave um, a little bit earlier, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, it it was uh, really encouraging to see that all this is finally coming to uh, coming to fruition, and that uh, Cosmos is apparently going to be launching soon. Mm -hmm. So happy right. and excited. Hopefully about that. tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, I'll actually also be, uh, you know, I'll be in Europe actually for, you know, the rest of the month until April 1st. So 
Uh, I'm going from here from Switzerland. I'm going to Berlin next. Uh, I'll be at the uh, ZK Summit, which are hosted, which is hosted by you know our good friends at the Zero Knowledge Podcast. Uh, and so they're host. I'm going to be uh, running a uh, scalability uh, work, breakout session there. We'll we'll just be chatting about you know you know different up things and the you know the cutting edge research and scalability. So if anyone's in Berlin on March 22nd, you should uh, come by to that. And then um, after that, I'll be in Barcelona for a week. And so if anyone is in Barcelona and just wants to hang out and meet up, I'd, I know I'm just spending a week there. So I'd love to meet up with anyone. Feel free to DM me on Twitter. Cool. So today we have a repeat guest, which doesn't happen often. Uh, but today our guest is, or well, we have a repeat guest and another guest. So our guests are uh, Brian Hoffman and Washington Sanchez of Open Bazaar. And we did an episode on Open Bazaar in February of 2015 uh, on episode 67. So if you want to listen to that one, you can. Uh, but um, so yeah, Open Bazaar is this open marketplace, a decentralized marketplace, and where people can buy and sell goods, kind of like eBay or Etsy, and you use crypto to 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 do the payment. And what's really interesting about this project is that you know it started in 2015. You know, just as Ethereum was starting, I don't even think the crowd sale had occurred already, had it? Maybe, maybe it had. Um, but anyway, it was just at the beginning. And a lot of the infrastructure that we have now and that we kind of take for granted didn't exist back then. And the conversation at the time was very much centered around, you know, let's let's make Bitcoin a payment mechanism. And people were talking about you know, merchant adoption. And when you'd go to your favorite bar, you'd try to encourage the, the bartender to like start taking Bitcoin. And that conversation has changed a lot over the years. And that, that narrative is not really what's driving Bitcoin anymore. But Open Bazaar has really trade, stayed true to the vision as this, this trade marketplace um, that sort of champions privacy and an open and sort of like openness in terms of what you can sell there. Um, so it's really great to see this project um, uh, still exist and seems to be doing well and growing. And they have plans now to build a mobile app, etc. So uh, it was a really interesting conversation. What did you think about it? Right, like you know, I I think Open Bazaar is you know you could actually consider it one of like the earliest DApps. Uh, you know, it is sort of a DApp if you think about it, and I, you know, I've just like, you know, I've had Open Bazaar on my computer for a while. I, I, I use it like once or twice to actually buy like some like, you know, Bitcoin graphics or something like a desk. I think it was a desktop wallpaper or something that I really liked. Uh, then this was like two or three years ago now. But, um, you know, I, if you just like open up the app, it's like, you know, it's it looks nice. Like the UI is sleek. It like seems usable. And that's just something you don't really see much in the UI UX of the app ecosystem right now and so you know i think a lot of you know it part of it is just the age right you know like you mentioned four or five years old now and so it just had a lot of time to iterate and like see what works see what doesn't and it's really cool because it's like literally like an entire decentralized marketplace built completely on decentralized infrastructure it uses cryptocurrencies for payments ipfs it uses uh you know it has tor integration for privacy so you know just all sorts of really cool fully it's like a takes a lot of cool technologies and puts them together into a seamless user experience which was really cool to me yeah and it's 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 not a blockchain it, it, like it doesn't have an underlying blockchain other than just the payments that you know you use bitcoin or some cryptocurrency for payments but the data itself and the peer to peer aspect of the of the app itself doesn't use a blockchain which i think is 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 important um, because you know it, it shows that you don't need a blockchain for everything that's decentralized. You can also use sort of like these peer-to-peer -peer libraries, or you can use something like IPFS for data. So, um, yeah. So without further ado, here's a conversation with Brian Hoffman and Washington Sanchez of Open Bazaar. So we're here with our guests today, uh, Brian Hoffman and Washington Sanchez of Obi One and Open Bazaar. And today we're going to be talking about Open Bazaar and you know, the evolution of that project since we last had uh, Brian on uh, over four years ago. So thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's wonderful. So Brian, last time you were on was episode 67. 
uh, which is, uh, yeah, over four years ago. I was, I was listening to it earlier. It was uh, February 15th, 2015. And back then, Open Bazaar was just starting or at least maybe had, maybe had launched, but um, wasn't quite uh, like a production version yet. Uh, certainly, you guys had not done your crowd sale uh, at that point. So why don't you, uh, maybe we'll start with you. Please uh, introduce yourself for our news listeners, those who maybe haven't heard that episode, and uh, tell us how you got involved in crypto. Sure. So uh, my name is Brian Hoffman, obviously, and uh, uh, I got into crypto probably early 2012. Um, I think the last time we did the podcast was, I think we were actually in negotiations to get our funding for ob1 like while that was occurring because we we founded uh, ob1 just a couple months after that or a month after that uh podcast um but yeah i mean i got into the space early on just interested in it because i came from a um a pki background doing like secure messaging and encrypted stuff uh for for government cl clients and uh, stumbled across Bitcoin and was always looking for an interesting project to work on uh, when I came across uh, Dark Market, which is what Open Bazaar spun out of. And uh, it kind of just led to me ending up taking over the project. And uh, so, you know, that was my first opportunity to actually get heavily involved in actually building stuff on, uh, within uh, Bitcoin. You know, as, as we all know, being a core dev is a pretty high bar, to, a barrier to entry. So, you know, that wasn't really an option at the time. So uh, I was really fortunate to, to come across this and, and be able to work on this for the last four and a half years. I'm sorry, was I mistaken in saying that you guys did a crowd sale? You guys raised, you guys actually raised money from-, from Yeah, that. yeah, sorry, I should have corrected that. But um, yeah, we did, we have not done a crowd sale um, at all. We, I when we were, you know, running Open Bazaar, it was it was kind of hectic and crazy hours, and we wanted to to fund it through some natural crowd sell process. But at that time, you know, ICOs were not even a thing. I think the most anybody had raised through crowdfunding was was Dark Wallet, which I think only raised like fifty thousand um, dollars. And so we ended up seeking traditional venture capital, uh, and and so we raised our first round with Andreessen Horowitz and Union Square Ventures in early two thousand fifteen. I think Swarm had raised quite a bit. I don't know if Swarm had raised already by then or not. I, I think they have. I feel like they had, and, and, and they had raised over, I think over a million dollars on Counterparty. Oh no, they hadn't raised a million. I don't know. This is all I think they were trying this to raise. Like, yeah, they were trying to raise some ridiculous amount, like 20 million or some, some huge amount at the time, which seemed huge at the time, but now it was like overshadowed by, you know, <laughs> what your typical SEO used to raise. Right. Four billion. <laughs> Uh, so Washington, uh, uh, turning now to you, uh, how did you get involved in blockchain and crypto? Um, I heard about Bitcoin. I mean, I vaguely recall hearing about Bitcoin either sometime in 2010 or maybe even earlier. Um, and I, I kind of thought, oh, that's cool, but I don't know whether it will work. And, and then I... Um, you know, I kept on seeing it pop up here and there, and and uh, I went back and I, you know, read the white paper and had my, uh, you know, uh, the amazing moment where I was like, "This is amazing! It's going to change everything." And so I, I just followed it on, you know, and just really cheered the project on. Um, uh, when it came to Open Bazaar, leading up to it, I was already very much thinking about the idea of a marketplace that would match Bitcoin's, you know, fundamental design being decentralized and open and how, you know, this is really a complementary piece of infrastructure that needs to exist. And then, um, you know, I, all of a sudden I saw in my emails something called Dark Market that Amir Taki was work, working on. And, um, you know, it, that was just a hackathon and uh, they didn't do any work on it afterwards. And, and then on Reddit, I saw that, um, some dude called Brian Hoffman was working on something called Open Bazaar, and I, I kind of f followed it in passing, and and then uh, I got sucked in, just coming up with ideas, writing articles, and here we are, so many years later. So, so let's go back then to that to that origin story. Uh, so, the Open Bazaar was a project that originated at a hackathon, I think in Toronto. Uh, Amirataki was working on it was called Dark Market. 
and I was listening to the the previous episode and and uh, and was reminded of that of that story. But let, let's let's maybe go back there and and uh, talk about how that idea originated and how it became Open Bazaar. Yeah, I remember that was actually a very uh, uh, in- interesting hackathon because Amir Taki started Dark Market at that hackathon. He placed first place. And then uh, Ethan Buckman and Vlad Zamfir, this is like when they, when those two actually first got into blockchain and they actually came in second place at that hackathon. So very eventful hackathon that, that, that day in Toronto uh, brought a lot of people into the space. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know too that the, the team that Amir led at, in Toronto for that hackathon actually consisted of a bunch of the devs from uh, Airbits at the time, which is now Edge Wallet, which is another uh, project and company that's been around for a very long time. Yeah, I mean, basically, like, I, I believe that the, you know, I've, I've talked to the guys from Airbits and stuff. I, I haven't talked to Amir directly about that experience, but evidently when they were at the hackathon they were trying to come up with an idea and amir had been tossing around the idea of an unstoppable silk road for a while because uh ross had just been apprehended a couple months prior to that in late 2013 and uh i think that was still very salient in everybody's minds uh, you know you know like why if it was using bitcoin like how did it get shut down it was all centralized you know how could we take you know, the technology behind things like BitTorrent and, and, and use crypto and, and build this in a way that there is nobody running it or that, you know, it's, you know, it can't be shut down or censored. And so that was the impetus for, for dark market. I think the problem though, is that at that time they were heavily invested in dark wallet and really were just trying to raise more capital to continue working on that. And so they didn't really have the bandwidth or the organization to, to build out dark market into a real product, which is where we came in. So uh, do you have anything to add there, Washington? Yeah, I mean, it was it was quite a short hackathon, but extremely impactful. Um, I know there was a very very strong response in the in the Bitcoin community to its efforts. I think everybody understood the idea of um, you know, of what this could accomplish if it was if it was created. Um, but yeah, I mean, from from what was created in that hackathon to you know what we started with and and what open bazaar has become today has been quite quite a significant technical journey so so brian how did you like kind of pick up the uh dark market project from that like so were you at the hackathon and you heard about it there or did you like hear about it afterwards and at at what point did you realize that the dark wallet team it's not their primary focus and so what what inspired you to like step up and take over this project essentially yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, I was kind of looking for something that I could get in on. And, um, you know, like many others, I saw the the coverage of them winning the award and I saw the video of them showing the product off and I thought it was super fascinating. I mean, not just the idea of, you know, creating a Silk Road, so to speak, but just the idea that this was actually something beyond a wallet. You know, up until that time, most of the things that people were doing with Bitcoin were just wallets. It wasn't any kind of like real dap, so to speak. It didn't hadn't even been kind of in coined the phrase. And so, um, you know, then then they then I found out they released the GitHub. Uh, they they released the source code for that hackathon project on GitHub and said, you know, here it is. And so I started like submitting some pull requests to their code and 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 then I emailed Amir directly because I didn't get any response from them on GitHub. And I was like, hey, I'm really serious about contributing to this project. You know, let me know where I can help. Uh, and, and he wrote me back and said, look, I'll be honest with you. We're not, we're not going to do anything with this. You know, if you want to fork it and just go, go to town, I'll link your repo in, in our GitHub page. And, you know, I've had a cut, he's like, I have had a couple other people interested in doing so, but we don't want to manage this thing. And I was like, all right, fine. So at that point I was like, if I'm going to fork it, I, I want to, I don't want to like, if they're not associated with it, I don't feel it's genuine to call it dark market still it, like, cause they had the dark branding they had dark wallet and then dark market. And I was like, okay, let's just do a clean slate. The idea is that this is a truly open marketplace, not just for illicit goods. You know, obviously dark implies it's a black market. We want it to be open to everyone. And so I recoined it open bazaar, forked it. And then they linked us in the original repo. And I think it's still there. If I believe, I believe if you go to their, their, GitHub repo for dark market, it just links to us. And, uh, and then I went on Reddit and I put a post and I said, 
you know, I'm going to be forking this as if anybody wants to work on it with me, you know, come along. And I think the first comment was like, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> we don't, we don't, you know, you're a poser. And I was like, all right, great. I guess I'm not going to get any help. But slowly and surely I started getting more and more people contributing uh, patches because they were going to the dark market repository and getting linked over to mine. And they just started following it and joining it. And, um, you know, there's actually, I mean, I, I'd have to go back and look at exactly all the people, but there's actually been some really great and, and somewhat prominent developers that worked on it early on that contributed. There's a couple people that went to Blockstream and, and stuff like that that were contributing really good ideas. And Washington was actually one of the best early uh, uh, contributors, not, not from a code perspective, but he, w he had come with a bunch of already thought out ideas of how we could improve the marketplace. I mean, originally it was a very basic, um, you know, escrow type marketplace idea, but he brought along these ideas of like doing more contract based transactions that had state and, you know, it was more involved and, 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 and several other like really interesting ideas about where we could take open bazaar that made it much more than just a simple hackathon project. So, you know, that those early contributions were massive in terms of getting, uh, brand awareness and interest in what we were doing. I mean, it's a project that quickly escalated within like three weeks. I think, you know, I had spoken to Wired Magazine and Forbes and all these people were calling me. It was, it was kind of crazy. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow, and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly, modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof-of-stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So before we go uh, you know, any further into talking about like, you know, Maybe the first thing we should do is, you know, some people might not be aware, like what exactly is Open Bazaar? Like, what is the goal here? Like, you know, I think maybe many people have heard this like tagline of like decentralized marketplace, but like, what does that mean? And like, maybe, maybe a good way to do it is maybe you could like explain like a use, walk through a user story and like how a user would be using Open Bazaar and yeah. Sure. Um, so a decentralized marketplace, what does that even mean? I mean, a marketplace itself is kind of centralized, right? It's it's a grouping of merchants and buyers. It's a way to connect people to do transactions, right? I mean, you have to think to the idea of the name Open Bazaar. Like a bazaar is a marketplace where it's like vendors come from wherever. You go in there, you're interacting with them closely. There's negotiating and haggling. There's private conversations. It's not, it's a loosely organized group of vendors and buyers. And, um, you know, that was kind of the idea behind Open Bazaar, which was, you know, can we take peer to peer technology in crypto and open this completely global marketplace that doesn't, you know, there's no facilitator, it's just a protocol that everybody knows how to speak with each other, and and do this same kind of concept on a, on a much grander scale and do it absolutely free, like not just free as in terms of, you know, doing what you want, but also the cost is not there because everyone shares their part of the infrastructure. You know, you're not going through a bunch of centralized servers in some huge data center managed by a company. You're just connecting directly with the people you want to do business with. And so that was the idea. You know, it's like you don't pay for the Internet, right? Like you pay for hosting and everything at the edge. But the core protocol is free. You don't pay to transact on the Internet. And this would be like a, a commerce layer on top of that, a free trade protocol. Because, you know, we have the technology uh, to build something to, to supplant Amazon and Etsy and eBay, who are basically just rent seekers. They're just, you know, slurping up your information and taking a cut for, for ma matchmaking, 
we don't need that anymore. We have these consensus protocols and things that allow us to do that without people intervening. Um, so it's, it, I mean, you can expand upon it forever and ever and ever, but the core idea is really just free trade over the internet. Uh, so since, since you were last on the podcast, I mean, it, it's, it's been, it's been four years and I, I want to point out that I, I, there, there's not many projects out there that have sort of stood the test of time like open bazaar and also have stayed true to the vision. I mean, obviously there are companies that were started back then that are still around. Uh, but Open Bazaar is one of these open projects that has continued to exist, to grow, I guess, presumably, and um, hasn't really changed its vision or even its sort of technical underlining, um, even though, you know, one could argue that there are all kinds of technologies today that, you know, could perhaps achieve the same thing or, or better. Um, but I would like you to walk us through the, the history and the timeline of like, what has happened since then in these four years? Like what are some major milestones and some major achievements that, that, um, that have come? Yeah. I mean, the stuff that's happened since then could probably span many podcasts. Um, but you know, I mean, I think not only has our work changed and, and our organization changed, but you know, the, the whole crypto ecosystem has changed dramatically. I mean, you have to think like when Open Bazaar came out, like Ethereum hadn't even done, I believe, their, their presale. And, and, you know, think about how much has changed just since Ethereum came on the scene. Um, but, you know, 2004, so 2004, we started the project. I mean, it was just an open source side project that we were working on on nights and weekends and whenever we had spare time, you know, by the end of that, you know, in early 2015, when we did the podcast with you guys, it was starting to morph into, you know, more of a, a business or like we were hoping to build this company around it so that we could do it full time. So we secured funding, you know, in early 2015. And at that point, you know, we raised about a million dollars uh, from that. And so then it became like, okay, so we're going to try and solidify this team. We're not, we don't, we're going to have this loose group of contributors through GitHub, but like now we want to form a company around this that's going to support it, sort of like Blockstream does for Bitcoin. And so, you know, we started picking out our best contributors and, and bringing them on board and building out the company team. And then we realized like, okay, now we have the time, the money, the team to really do this much more in a much more mature way. And you come, come from development background. So, you know, I understood that, you know, this, you know, these these contributors that go in and out and it's not a consistent way to build a really great product to scale. So, uh, so we decided to re redo the, the product and we started rebuilding it from scratch. So we kind of had this like hacked version of dark market code and we, we tried to morph it into something good, but we realized that we just had to scrap most of it. So we rewrote the whole product through to 2015 and end of 20, or I guess the beginning of 2016, we released open was our one, you know, version one, what we call version one which is, I guess, kind of two. But anyway, that was it was the first complete version or that we felt was like as close to the vision as possible. And when we released that, you know, we had truly decentralized search. Um, you know, it was the first complete product. It had, you know, dispute resolution so people could like, you know, do use escrow services to like, you know, figure out if they had problems and things like that and create more trust. And, but, you know, one of the things that we learned quickly is that, you know, these, the technology is really nascent. Like, even though we were one of the most mature products in the space, like a lot of people got frustrated because it's very difficult and cumbersome to do simple things, you know, things that were very simple on the internet through a web browser were very difficult to do with Bitcoin and, and the desktop application, which is already a huge hurdle for users. And the search was really, really bad. I mean, you can think of it, you know, we have all these computers all over the world, you know, computers and slow connections in Africa, you know, they have data on their computers. And now your search engine has to go out to all those guys and get and create like a very fast experience, you know, for when you're searching bicycles and you have to compete with Google, who is like a very centralized optimized index of all that stuff. It, 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 it just the, the disparity between the experience we were providing and what people could get on centralized services was just too, too great. And so 2016, we were looking around for some alternatives to what we had built. 
and we stumbled across uh, IPFS, which was just getting out of the gates. And that they were doing so much of what we were doing, but like they were dedicated to just focusing on the networking piece of it. And so we went back to the drawing board and we rewrote all of it over again uh, on top of IPFS. And that was probably one of our best decisions ever because it opened up uh, the doors to do so much more with uh, the way that OpenBazaar worked in terms of user experience. Um, we were able to now, um, you know, one of the huge things that people uh, complained about in our first version was that if you were a store, you had to keep your computer running all the time. You had to have the app running 24 seven in order to take orders. And that was a really bad experience. IPFS, for instance, allowed us to uh, introduce offline orders. So, you know, Bitcoin doesn't require you to be online to send payments to people. Why should Open Bazaar uh, require you to be online to take sales? And so that was a huge benefit of moving to IPFS, for instance. And there were a lot more than that. But so 2.0 came out in late 2016, I guess. I think we were beta betaing it at the end of 2016. And so that's the software version that we've had since, uh, uh, you know, that we currently run. And, uh, you know, we've been working on improving that and, you know, through 2017 and late 2017, when we had the huge bull run up to 20 K and, and all that, um, you know, we, we started to come across the whole fee crisis, which was like Segwit 2X and all that drama. And that was a major milestone for open bazaar as a project, because, you know, fundamentally we're not a Bitcoin project. We weren't a Bitcoin project. We were a trade free trade project. We just happened to use Bitcoin as our payment mechanism. And so even though we were really well known in the space, you know, we wanted to do commerce. We wanted to do payments. We wanted to do, you know, this peer to peer communication, all these things that we thought Bitcoin could do really early on. That's even Satoshi thought about early on. It was starting to morph into this whole store value kind of conversation and narrative uh, at that time. And so the fees were going really up and, you know, all we did was allow people to use Bitcoin, no other payment mechanisms. And people were selling t-shirts and stickers and books, you know, things that were like sub $50 and the fees were almost getting to the same price as the products. So uh, our users were getting very frustrated. Uh, they, they were they were complaining to us when we sort support tickets, all this stuff. And and so we realized we had very quickly we had to do something about that. And so we changed our thinking and said, look, what if we were a marketplace that was agnostic to payment mechanisms? Let's just not be so married to Bitcoin itself. What would we look like? And so we we had to design what we call the multi wallet, which is allowing us to accept and use multiple different coins and plug in more as we go. And so we became more of a neutral in terms of which coins we support uh, platform. And and right now we only support a, a handful, but um, there's the, flu the flexibility is there for us to expand as, as needed into others to accommodate different types of approaches. So if you're more of a privacy focused person, you can use uh, Zcash. You know, if you're just Bitcoin, Bitcoin, if you want Bitcoin cash, whatever. So that, that's, that's kind of how we change as a, as a organization. Um, through that time period. And, and now we've got a whole bunch of other things going on as well. But um, yeah, that's kind of as quick of a, a history a lesson on Open Bazaar as I can give you right now, <laughs> if you have questions. Yeah. I, so, you know, I know currently you guys support uh, the, the four coins you support right now from what I saw was Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin and Zcash. Mm -hmm. um, how is the how have users been, you know, reacting to the actual idea of, you know, using uh bitcoin and like and cryptocurrencies for payments like you know especially given like the high volatility of last year so one of the things that happened was l last year was the fees made it harder for people to spend bitcoin but then also you know you it, the changes in price it's like kind of you know it made it hard and so how what was the ux like around that last year and then also um any plans to like support like you know more like stable coin like mechanisms like die and whatnot um, I'll take the first part and maybe Washington, you could talk about the, the, the other part. Sure. If that's cool. Um, the volatility. Uh, yeah, I think that's a huge double edged sword. One, you know, that run up in crypto, 
created massive interest in Bitcoin and all the other coins. And so we got a massive influx of people interested in, in using Open Bazaar and like learning about it and stuff. But at the same time, it was very unusable for certain use cases because of the cost of the fees. And so, you know, it was it was kind of it, it was a pro and a con. And then since then, you know, obviously interest has waned a lot more in terms of, you know, that hysteria. And so we have less, you know, we have less traffic as do all the exchanges and everything else in terms of uh, interest in just the products. But it's a much more focused and usable technology. So it's it's like you can't you're, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't in a lot of ways. Um, and then I'll let Washington talk about the, the coin stuff. I mean, or if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think something that especially people who've just joined this crazy circus in the past two years are not aware of is just how significantly the mentality to spend in cryptocurrency has changed in in just a few years. I mean, before everybody in, in the Bitcoin space was saying, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's going to take over the world. It's going to be the major payment system. We're going to use it to buy our things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now because of the fee run up and the, you know, absolute core decision of not increasing the block size, not making it friendly for payments at the base layer, the entire narrative to justify that decision has completely changed. Now it's like Brian said, it's a store of value. You're not supposed to pay for it. You know, you should use Bitcoin to pay for things. If you use if anybody who tells you to spend your Bitcoin is an enemy of Bitcoin, you know, you have these kinds of extremists coming out there saying utter nonsense. And I mean, this, this is the kind of thing that we've had to ride, you know, uh, the, uh, and, and adjust to. But I mean, look, there are other cryptocurrencies and it's a very different world um, just in a, in a few years. I mean, when we got started, it was Bitcoin and that was over 90% of the market was was Bitcoin. And now it's what, very close to 50%, just a little bit over 50%. Um, and you have other cryptocurrencies where they're very much focused on using crypto for payments, to buy things, to sell things, for real economic utility, not as a, a gateway to get rich in a few years by hodling. So, um, I mean, that's, that's one of the, the major obstacles we've had to face, particularly in the last couple of years. But... To your point about uh, stable coins and uh, as an answer to the volatility, that's obviously something that's been huge. I mean, the emergence of DAI in particular, MakerDAO and, and DAI as a stable coin, has been you know quite significant in the Ethereum community. And something that we've been working very hard on these past several months is integrating Ethereum into Open Bazaar. So not only can you buy and sell things in ETH, but you can buy and sell things in any ERC20 token and especially the uh, stable coins. So we've been working very hard on that and you know, that should be coming out hopefully soon. A larger question maybe around like how the UX of OpenBazaar works is why are there only a certain number of like supported coins? Like, you know, let's, so let's say I go and find a, you know, I, I, I search OpenBazaar for, you know, stickers and I find a sticker I wanna buy and, you know, why can't I make an agreement with that merchant that, hey, uh, I want to pay you in Grin or Dogecoin, right? Like, why, why do I have to use one of the four supported currencies? Can't, like, you know, I just send him a Dogecoin address and, you know, he'll, he'll, uh, uh, he'll give me a Dogecoin address. I'll pay him the Dogecoin and he'll send me the sticker. Why? What, 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 what does it mean to support a currency in Open Bazaar? Yeah, sure. So... Um, what you're describing is very similar to our crypto trading feature. So um, if you if you you can create a listing within Open Bazaar Marketplace to sell crypto, and you can actually list for sale over two thousand coins, like all the ones from Coin Market Cap, right? Like and we obviously don't support we don't have that wallet in Open Bazaar. We only have four coins, like you said. But how do we do that? Well, we kind of do what you're saying. Like when people They'll, they'll, they'll pay Bitcoin, one of the four coins out of their wallet to that listing. The other person will send them Dogecoin to their address and then they'll release the funds out of Open Bazaar to them. So it's kind of like, it's, it's similar to what you're talking about. And yeah, that can be done. I mean, that's what's happening there. 
Um, why do we not do that for the for the primary purchases? Well, you know, what what's what's going on with an open bazaar is we use multi sig escrow accounts to do to create trust for that payment. So in that scenario that I mentioned to you, that wouldn't ha that wouldn't work if I I mean you'd have to put a lot of trust in that person to deliver the the product or coin. If if I just paid you Bitcoin and said okay now send me Dogecoin to this address, there's no assurance that you'll ever do that. I mean, you could, and you can't be anonymous. You're not going to trust that person. So, in, so in order to get around that, what we do is we pay into a multi uh, multi sig open bazaar wallet that's owned by the merchant, the buyer, and then a moderator. Which is like, if there's a problem, that person will step in. It's a two of three multi sig wallet that's created by Open Bazaar, and then you know that allows us to create a mechanism with an open bazaar so that you send it into the escrow they deliver the dogecoin that you bought and then when you're happy you release the funds out of that two of three multi-sig wallet to the merchant and then there's this inherent trust there and if there's a problem now you have a third party to step in and 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 do a, a dispute resolution process if needed so so that's why we do that and and, we'll, and what we mean by supporting the coin is we have to build that multi-sig wallet like ETH, Ethereum, for instance, doesn't even have native multi-sig support. So we have we had to build the smart contract to do multi-sig for Open Bazaar, and that's that's something we integrated. And uh, you know, and we have different wallet interface requirements for the, for the app itself. So you know, uh, that that's what I mean by building a wallet, and that takes work. That takes some time. And, and even the wallet itself has been a bit of a technical journey. I mean. Uh, when we moved to Open Bazaar 2.0, one of the things we were very proud of was, you know, using an, a Bitcoin SPV client in the background as as the wallet. But then when we moved to the multi currency paradigm, then it was just not feasible to use multiple coins running multiple SPV nodes in the background, especially if we're going to be adding more coins. I mean, and then what do you do when you have Ethereum? Like it, it just becomes ridiculous. And then uh, the the problem escalates when you try to port Open Bazaar over to web or to mobile. So you know, changing the 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 way that the wallet works so that it becomes an API based wallet where it's fetching information about the blockchain by an API rather than using you know a, a light client for one of those coins was not only technical work that we had to do, but also putting up the infrastructure to support that that's uh, scalable. So uh, speaking of these escrows that we were talking about, um, how do we like, how do you choose the moderator for like, you know, so you said there's a two of three multi-sig and so, you know, it's the buyer, the seller and some third moderator. Who, where does this third moderator come in? Who, who, who decides it? And like, is it, is there a public listing of like trusted moderators or how does this work? The, the moderator role can be fulfilled by any node on the network. So if you want to join Open Bazaar and you just want to do dispute resolution, you can set yourself up as a moderator. You can say, well, these are the fees when I take on a dispute resolution. You could even put a little description. This is how I'm going to do my dispute resolution. Then it's up to buyers and sellers to choose you and to include you in their transactions. Um, and that process is completely open um, and, and, and anybody can join. OB1, the company, has a list of what we call verified moderators. These are people who we know are moderators on the network. Um, they've you know, voluntarily publicly associated their identities to something that's verifiable. So they have to have key-based profiles. We say, all right, we need you to state very clearly what your fees are, what your dispute resolution policy is, a whole bunch of criteria. And if they meet that criteria, then we add them to our verified moderator list. And that's really just a guide. For people who are just joining Open Bazaar and they don't really know, you know, which moderators should we trust here, which ones are the good guys that are not going to screw me, or you know, who are really good at dispute resolution. And so that's where we try to help out. Yeah, I mean, it's important to note that it's still pretty early days in terms of like decentralized trust, right? I mean, we we've spent a lot of time thinking and, and working through ways to improve that mechanism. Um, and we get a lot of suggestions from the community. In fact, we funded an effort called uh, uh, Trust is Risk, which is a, a research project based out of Greece uh, University, uh, a university in Greece. And we, we helped fund that project so that they could look at ways of using Web of Trust uh, in order to create trust graphs and, and make 
better decisions without having to rely on someone like Obi One uh, blessing certain moderators as being verified, so to speak. I mean, that's that's ideally where we'd like to head. We want to start, you know, our, our approach is like, okay, decentralize everything we can and then slowly start to decentralize the pieces that we haven't been able to or like as we discover new technologies. So that could be search, that could be the dispute process, any place where there's like too heavily, we're too heavily reliant on centralized actors, that those are ripe for us to disrupt. And that's what we're always working towards. So let's let's maybe dive into some of the technical aspects a little bit. So we mentioned um, IPFS already and some of the underlying structure there. So can you describe the tech stack? You know, I, I think to a lot of people listening to the show, we'll be familiar with smart contracts and maybe the way you know, other applications and dApps were built on this on this maybe like a DAO principle or some kind of a structure similar to a DAO, but but Open Bazaar isn't really built this way. Let's let's dive into that. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, when you hear the word DAP, you usually just assume Ethereum DAP. And most of them kind of have this same kind of stack, which is that you have the blockchain and all the code is resi- and data is residing in the blockchain. And then you have this thin client DAP layer, which is just a bunch of interface code, really, that interacts with the blockchain through uh, MetaMask or whatever, right? Like through the Web3. Um, in our case, it's a little bit different, right? Like we're more like a BitTorrent peer. So uh, so the logic that drives OpenBazaar does not reside in a blockchain. We really only use blockchain for the payment mechanism in the escrow uh, scenario. And so for us, our tech stack looks more like uh, we use uh, libp2p at the networking layer, which allows us to do peer-to-peer networking, and and every compute, you know, every device connects to the OpenBazaar network independently, and and then on top of that, IPFS, which is like the data storage layer, which talks on top of libp2p. So this allows us to store data into the network. So we're not storing it in a blockchain; we're storing it in a peer-to-peer network, and it gets distributed across all those peers. So wait, like, you're not I, a blockchain? What are you even we're doing on this podcast? <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. We're, we're not a blockchain. We'll leave now. Um, yeah, but no, I mean, the whole idea behind this is like we early on, you know, when we were building Open Bazaar, we're like, okay, how do we do Bitcoin scripting or like how do we use op returns and all this stuff? I remember very early on, we went into the Bitcoin devs or, or Bitcoin wizards IRC chat. And we were some one of our guys was asking uh, questions about how we could store data in the blockchain on Bitcoin blockchain. And I think it was like Greg Maxwell was like, you guys are fucking idiots. You got to get out of here. Like, and wanted to boot us out of the IRC chat. And it was like, you're going to spam the blockchain. And that was just like, we went down a really dark path there for a little bit. Um, so, so very early on, we realized like, okay, data is not going into blockchain. How do we get around that? And uh, IPFS was like a perfect marriage of, of solving that problem. So we keep all of the non-payment uh, data out of that into the IPFS network, which is great. Uh, so we have, you know, that's the data layer. And then, you know, then we have the application code, which is a desktop app in its current form. Uh, but, you know, we reuse that logic and, and code uh, within our upcoming mobile app. And we're hoping to port that to the web as well. And all that is open. And that is what, you know, allows you to understand, like, how do I create a listing? How do I buy it? How do I dispute it? You know, all these different things. And then obviously there's the wallet component, which is kind of to the side. And that's where we have the multi-wallet that can do many different coins and payments. And you pull that in for your transactions as needed. So that's where the blockchain fits in. So that's why I say we're not really like a Bitcoin project, so to speak. We're more of a free trade project that happens to use crypto to enable that. Interesting. So when one opens the, the, the Open Bazaar app, um, and I encourage you guys, you know, listeners to, to download it and, and try it out. Uh, I actually, it's been on my, it's been on my Mac for years. Like it just was there in the application folder, I realized. Um, so I Same opened here. it up. So, so I opened it up, uh, you know, just before and like went back into it and, you know, it's, it's quite nice and it, it looks kind of like eBay and you can search and you can filter. And so from what, what it looks like is that there's, uh, there's a, 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 a an open bazaar kind of I don't want to say curated but somewhat uh, filtered search engine because 
all of the stuff that you see here in the Open Bazaar app on, on that provided search page, that's not all of what's on Open Bazaar. I mean, there might be other listings on other marketplaces or maybe perhaps even not even on marketplaces. People might be even just sharing Open Bazaar uh, endpoints on social media or you know forums or this sort of thing. But there's a there's a there's a, a set of listings that you guys uh, feature in in your search engine. Can you explain how that works and why you do this? Yeah, sure. Um, I think Washington will have some ideas on this as well. But I think this is a prime example of you know what has served us to last so long too is this you know, constant battle of pragmatism versus ideology. You know, early on when we started Open Bazaar, everything had to be completely decentralized and we fought every little, you know, effort to to try and centralize anything. And we produced a a search experience within the app that was just abysmal uh, because just the technology doesn't really exist to do that efficiently and in a way that could be adopted by even even crypto enthusiasts, not, not just main, mainstream casual users. Uh, it just was a very bad UX. And so one of the, one of the compromises that we made when we moved to 2.0 and IPFS was that we would make the search more federated. So in that respect, what we did was we said, okay, we can't stop people from putting these products and services on the platform, but we'll make the search, uh, controlled by third parties. Uh, sort of like the web browser does, right? Like like Mozilla Firefox doesn't have a search engine. They let you use Google or Yahoo or whatever your choice is. So that was the, the approach we adopt. So we said, we'll open source all the search code and, and we'll just let people create their own search engines. And if they want to filter out guns and drugs on one and make it safe for users, fine. If they want to add in a verified moderator scheme to help people find trusted uh, merchants, do that, fine. But and people could have different approaches to the way that they curate or sensor or whatever, or control search results. The network itself is unstoppable, but the view that you have of the network is, is your choice. Because when you think about it, you know, how is your mom or dad ever going to use this? If the first thing they see when they open up the app is drugs and guns, they just don't care about that, right? Like their view of the internet is through Google. Google is essentially censors that, right? But they're, but, but you should have the freedom to explore beyond that if you want to. So that's the approach we've taken. So when you open the app and use OB1 search, you know, we follow, us federal guidelines you know in terms of like what we can show there and you know so we don't you won't find heroin or cocaine or you shouldn't we hope hope you don't but you know if you choose if you choose to seek that out there's other ways of getting to that data um so so that's kind of the idea behind that yeah i mean the the thing to really understand and and in many ways the this understanding was was really well established before bitcoin came along but um bitcoin comes along and we have this idea that the entire blockchain and all of the data, all of the transactions, uh, everybody has that data and it's replicated however many thousands of times on everybody's nodes. And now everybody thinks that this is the way you do peer-to-peer -peer and this is how decentralized networks work. Whereas the reality is, is that BitTorrent has proved for many, 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 many years before Bitcoin came along that you know people opt in to host the data that they are interested in. And so when I wanna like, okay, say if, if I were downloading an illegal movie, hypothetically, um, I would go and uh, I, I, would, I would find that data, my, my, my application would download it via BitTorrent and then I would cede that data to anybody else on the network who wanted it. And in, in exactly the same way, this is what happens on OpenBazaar. Your application on your computer doesn't have the entire marketplace because that's just gigabytes and gigabytes of data that you don't need. But when you go and you fetch data from the network, you become part of the swarm that's seeding that information to other people on the network. And so as uh, data on the network becomes more popular, it becomes more redundant faster because uh, you know more people are, are seeding that to other peers on the network. So it has this um, very beneficial response to scaling as opposed to you know crumbling when there's more demand it actually gets stronger and more resilient as there's more demand so as a result of that architecture that requires people to crawl the network and index what's on the network in order to comprehend and to sort through you know okay i want to find listings that are t-shirts 
So, you know, unless you go and you build a crawler to find that information for yourself, you're just going to need to resort to a, a third party search engine to, uh, to find where those listings are on the network and then fetch them. So isn't this something where like, you know, maybe some sort of middle ground between putting all data on a blockchain versus all data in the peer to peer network can be found. So, you know, instead of, because in, when you put all the data on the peer to peer network, like you said, now we have this issue where we have to constantly crawl the entire network, but couldn't you do something like, you know, you keep everything on the peer to peer network, but then you throw the IPFS hashes onto a blockchain. So that way they're easier, you know, you use the blockchain as indexing while obviously all the real data is off the blockchain. And, you know, you can even then, you know, start to get fancy with it. Like you can start doing like TCRs for like uh, token curated registries for like, uh, finding the best marketplace mar uh, merchants for a certain product or category and stuff like that. Yeah, 100%. That is that that's that is the ideal way to do it. And they're, it, it, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have centralized third-party search engines that crawl it in a very traditional way like we do. Um, we're also, in some of the token efforts that we're going to be doing in Open Bazaar, exactly what you're describing. So you can embed the hashes of the content that, you know, you... You, you want to promote out there into the storage of some smart contracts in, you know, in a way to make certain listings outshine others on the network. And so, yeah, all of those are, are valid approaches. Uh -huh. uh, so you mentioned this uh, future token listing. Uh, can you maybe go a little bit more into this and like what, what, are, what are some of the other things that you're trying to build here around this future token? Yeah, so the, the token itself is is not not in the mold of the, your traditional ICO. I mean, we're not doing this to, you know, raise two hundred million dollars in a ICO thing like that. It's it's very much our way of thinking, you know, okay, if we did a token, how would it add value to the network? Well, you know, we, we went through so many iterations of how a token where a token would make sense, you know. And many of the traditional ways that were, people were, you know, suggesting to us, which is like, oh, you know, you have to spend some tokens to create a listing that was immediately rejected because that immediately places a barrier to entry on anybody who wants to create a listing. And like, if you've got 10,000 SKUs, what are you going to buy, however, 10,000 tokens just to create those listings? It's unnecessary, both from a technical perspective and also from a cost perspective, because that will cost gas to... Uh, to do. I mean, at the end of the day, the long story short was that what made the most sense to us was uh, a, a scenario where you would spend some tokens and, and, and like wait to listings that you wanted to advertise. So we've designed a couple of different smart contracts where you can take a listing and you want to promote it to other people on the network and clients would look at that smart contract at the storage and see which listings have the most tokens that are staked for that listing. And um, that is built into an incentive mechanism that we're going to use because we're creating these tokens. We have the ability to just distribute them to early adopters of Open Bazaar. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we're not doing this with straight Ethereum or DAI because it would require people to have money to spend to stake onto listings, whereas we can just give it away and try and create an ecosystem where these incentives are operating by themselves. So yeah, we're, we're gonna be experimenting with that. Um, and we've also created smart contracts that reward people when they purchase listings um, on Open Bazaar. So, I mean, like we- rewards we've, points. Yeah. yeah, exactly, like a rewards points thing. I mean, our, our focus really has been on trying to make this token that we will be releasing have real utility, particularly from, a, from an ad space promoting content point of view. Um, and you know, we're, we're optimistic that that's going to work out really well. Cool. Um, and so maybe uh, no, another interesting topic, um, especially you know, given a lot of the origins of uh, Open Bazaar from Silk Road is like, the you know or you know a spiritual successor maybe is like around privacy so i remember you know like we like we talked about uh one of the things that you guys have done is added support for zcash so um 
one question is, you know, do you support like the actual proper Zcash shielded payments or right now is it only just the uh, complete transparent ones? We, we actually don't support the shielded transactions yet. Um, there's a couple technical reasons why, but yeah, that is definitely one limitation of using Zcash within OpenBazaar at the moment. Um, I believe it's mostly centered around the fact that we use multi-sig transactions. Right. Uh, so it's a little bit more complicated and we've actually like been having some detailed discussions with, uh, some of the developers over at Monero, um, mm -hmm. And, you know, to kind of walking through what that looks like for theirs as well, which is there's definitely some UX challenges around how you create these kinds of ring signatures and shielded transactions, things like that. Like, it's not as straightforward as just doing a Bitcoin transaction. So, right, right. yeah. Cool. And, and so what are like some of the other like, um, you know, privacy centric things that uh, are you know you guys may be working on developing like is there any plans for like tor integration so you know that's really what you know silk road you know had that whole like you know tor with like paying with bitcoins um you know what 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 open reserve seemed to do is you know it allowed the infrastructure to be decentralized but did did it add in the privacy aspect that silk road kind of started off with yeah i mean i think one of the the biggest things that you know, one of the most unique things about Open Bazaar versus some of these other platforms in terms of privacy is just that when you're doing transactions, it's completely peer to peer. And it's not peer to peer in the sense that like Uber's peer to peer. You know, <laughs> it's peer, it's truly peer to peer. If I'm going to buy something from, like, let's say you are doing something illicit, you're selling something illicit, I'm not going through some central hub where they're like monitoring what I'm doing and seeing me connect to that storefront and, you know, per making purchases and things like that. The privacy is, is is me to you and I'm making my order directly to you. So that information is not sitting on some server where if they take down the owner, they find all your orders and bust you or whatever, you know, like it's completely private. And it doesn't even have to just be around illicit transactions right like most people just want to be private in general so that they're not at risk of getting exploited in some other way i mean if amazon gets hacked tomorrow that you know they have a database wide open of credit card information purchase history social you know social connections anything that you were looking at or thinking about buying all that stuff right it's just ripe for the taking and it's all it's everybody in one place if if mm -hmm. open bazaar were to get exploited somehow you know this data is spread across all these you know how many ever peers that are on the network and it's all encrypted end to end. So privacy from that standpoint is already inherently built into the platform. Um, beyond that, we do allow people to connect through Tor. So if you're running Tor browser, for instance, and you fire up Open Bazaar, it'll be it'll detect that and say, hey, do you want to run all your stuff through Tor? Now, we haven't got a security audit yet, and it's not perfect. Uh, there could be issues with that, but you know, it's something that we want to continue to improve. Things like um, you know, in integrating Tor like natively within the app rather than allow, having to require other people to you know set it up outside of open bazaar or even maybe incorporating i2p as an option uh since ipfs could support that you know that would be another improvement we could do and there's and then obviously doing the security audit which we'd like to do at some point in the near future when the code is a little more stable but um yeah i mean i think privacy is is top of mind and we want to get much better at it. Uh, Sam, who's not on the call with us, is kind of like our, our chief privacy guy, you know, like, and, and we're, he's shifting into a more serious role regarding uh, addressing some of the things that we feel like we're not doing as well as we could. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're like juggling that with user experience as well. And so, there, you know, there are some trade-offs and compromises and we try to make those as transparent as possible to our users. You know, one of the things uh, that actually originally brought me to Open Bazaar was I, I, I was doing a lot of like, I had a lot of interest in like web of trust based stuff and reputation models. And so, you know, one of the things that a lot of these open marketplaces, or like, you know, online marketplaces and decentralized ones like Amazon or eBay, one of the main things that they do is uh, provide ratings for buyers and sellers and reputation so that like scammy sellers get like pushed off of the uh, marketplace. And I so I remember you guys have been like you know put put out a few papers. I think you Washington had like you know your your, your one of your theses one of your thesis or something was on one of these topics. But like you know how do you um, like you know how is your guys' thinking changed about like managing reputation within the open bazaar marketplace? 
Well, decentralized reputation um, is a complete shambles, basically. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's an incredibly difficult topic that really hasn't improved in several years um, that we've been involved. And I mean, our approach has been to keep it simple. One thing from our research that we found is that the more complicated a reputation system you design, it's like the more financial incentive you create to game it and then to scam people. It's ironically safer to be simpler. Um, and so from that perspective, what we have at the moment in Open Bazaar is just basically a simple rating system that if you're a buyer and you have a successful purchase or a successful dispute resolution in your favor, then you're able to leave a rating against the seller. And right before any trade or um, no, right at the start, one, once funds are put into escrow, the seller gives um, the buyer a rating key that basically proves that the seller and the buyer interacted, that it's, it's not sort of a naive rating, that it actually require both the buyer and the seller to have interacted at some point in order for the buyer to make the rating. But when it comes to the rating, nothing fancy. It's, you know, just scores out of five for different, um, for different uh, criteria. But how is that a uh, civil resistant? Oh, well, it's not really. I mean, the, the, the civil resistance uh, is limited in, in as far as I can't go on the network and just create thousands of ratings naively against, you know, every seller I can come across. I actually have to go through the order process and actually put funds in escrow in order to obtain a rating key to generate a valid rating against the seller. No, but isn't the concern that a seller would just give himself millions of fake ratings that are really high? Yeah, our rating, our rating system isn't resilient against that. And we don't claim that it is. And to be perfectly honest, we haven't seen a good solution to that problem. I mean, this problem you find on centralized marketplaces where, you know, sellers will create thousands of fake buyers and then buy stock from themselves and send the money around themselves. And then they generate, you know, all of these fake ratings. That's not a problem that we think has been solved in either a centralized or decentralized way. And unfortunately, once you try and solve it in a decentralized way, it starts to add a lot of cost and a lot of UX burden onto users that kind of undermines the, your entire rating system. Now, having said that, there's been a lot of really interesting work done. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was um, Trust is Risk, which was done by Dionysus Zindros. Um, so it was an idea that he and I were discussing, and then he wrote, I think his like he, he wrote a paper on that. So he wrote the paper, not me. But um, the, the idea essentially was, you know, creating um, essentially payment channels with other people on the Open Bazaar network. And the, the magnitude of the payment channel that you open with other people in the network would reflect the level of trust that you have with other peers on the network. And this was something we discussed several years before the Lightning Network came along. And I think that the Lightning Network in, in many ways improves upon that uh, initial idea and, and could um, be superimposed onto the Open Bazaar Network to establish that kind of web of trust. But I think there's a lot more research to be done there. And I, I think it's like one of the big unsolved challenges of, um, of this entire you know, ecosystem. One last thought on that. The rating data itself um, is all open so other people can find the rating data that buyers make against sellers that they've interacted with. And our thoughts there are, you know, you could have third parties or interest groups that, you know, crawl the network for that rating data and then can wait and rank that rating data based on, you know, associated factors like, you know, the, the buyer, was the buyer anonymous or did they choose to include their identity? And, you know, how well connected is their identity on Open Bazaar to real world identity. And then you could basically rank the, the overall rating that you calculate based on you know, other third party criteria. So in, in like search, the approach was to make the rating system, the rating data 
nice and open so that other people can, um, you know, analyze that data and go from there. So coming back to the usage of the platform, uh, can you give us a sense of how many people are using it, how many transactions and sales are happening here and how it's grown over the last couple of years? Yeah, sure. So uh, in terms of transactions and sales, it's all private. So we don't really have great numbers on that other than anecdotally from talking to some of our more contributing vendors and things like that. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, generally we have around 12 to 14,000 listings at any given time uh, available on the marketplace. Um, since we released our second version, we've had about 160,000 people on the network and we get about, we see between 400 and 700 new nodes on the network every day. The way that we're able to see that data is that through our search engine and crawling the network, um, you know, we know which IPs and, and peers were, um, connecting to in order to like crawl their listings and, and, and reviews. So that's based on raw data that our nodes sees when it crawls the network every day. Um, and so, you know, and in terms of usage, um, I mean, I would say we're still at a very like consistent, you know, you know, kind of horizontal growth, just slightly above horizontal, <laughs> you know, it's not like hockey stick growth or anything. Um, and we tend to ebb and flow in correlation with the popularity of crypto across the mainstream. So, you know, when we get, you know, price spikes and everybody gets excited, we tend to get more traffic. And when it's down, we tend to be down. So I think that we haven't really been able to escape, get that escape velocity outside of just general crypto insight. And to us, that means that our users are mostly people within crypto space and people that are knowledgeable in that. Like we don't see a lot of people outside of that that network using the platform, um, which is something we'd like to change with the mobile app. And I think, I think we have a good chance at, at improving that. But for now it's, yeah, we're looking at like, we call them crypto curious, you know, it's like people that are just, they want to know more about crypto and how to use it in a, in a day-to-day -day fashion. Cause there really aren't a lot of ways to like, once you get Bitcoin, I mean, you can buy something from a website or whatever, but like beyond that, what else, you know, are people using it for um, other than kind of speculating and trading? And this is one of those good options. Yeah, this is something uh, I think we also see in other types of user facing products like social networks that emerge from the crypto space often are very crypto centric. So a lot of the mm -hmm. news and information that, that, that converges there is about crypto. I think Steemit to some extent has been able to pop out of that a little bit, but a lot of the stuff there to me still feels very crypto related. Um, so I think that's a challenge. So you mentioned this mobile app, uh, and this is what I want to get come to next. Um, it's called Haven. Can you talk a bit more about that? What's the goal here? Yeah, uh, this is Washington's baby. So like, I don't want to steal too much thunder from him, but we're really, really excited about this. I mean, for years, we've realized that a desktop app is really not the modality that's going to explode into mainstream usage. Like it's just, it just isn't, you know, no buyer wants to have to download a, a hundred megabyte down desktop application in order to purchase a t-shirt. So we've known for a long time that we wanted to get away from that, get to the web, get to mobile. And we're on the cusp of releasing the mobile app, which is it's called Haven. And I'll let Washington explain a little bit more, but you know, this is definitely a game changer for us. We're, we're really targeting people beyond the crypto sphere. This is like a product designed to try and help us get out of that, uh, that, that loop that you just described. Yeah, I mean, Haven um, in many ways really takes it, takes Open Bazaar in the direction of you know, what we saw when we first, you know, started this project. Um, you know, I, I can speak for just for myself, but when, when, I, when I saw and started thinking about Open Bazaar, I didn't see Open Bazaar as just a protocol to buy and sell things. I thought that was exciting in and of itself, but really when I started thinking about it, it's like Open Bazaar is really a, a, a platform for self-expression and self-determination in a way that it marries, you know, uncensorable payments and an uncensorable marketplace. And then you can use that to 
you know, express yourself to uh, other people on, on this network that we're creating. And, and we can use the marketplace as the center of gravity to pull together multiple strings, um, you know, social and chat and all these, you know, th th this, we, we can use Open Bazaar to put together so many things that we can really create a, another parallel economy to the, uh, to the legacy financial economy. So Haven itself is really designed and inspired by WeChat. And uh, in, uh, I suppose the shorthand description of Haven is calling it the crypto WeChat, except that it's uh, not ridiculously monitored and controlled by the Chinese government. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not in that respect. It's not, not in that respect, WeChat. yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, but it's private. So as, as we discussed before, the marketplace interactions the chat end-to-end -end chat is all sorry the the chat is end-to-end -end encrypted it's got the multi-currency wallet it will have ethereum you'll have access to payments and all the other erc20 tokens stable coins lightning network will be in there at some point um so you know this and with the the other the other major feature that we're bringing into the app is is the social network it's a decentralized social network built on ipfs and the idea is, yeah, okay, the, the primary purpose of the social network is obviously to promote things that you want to sell and create a brand and create a following. But really, it's a social network. I mean, on a decentralized network, it could really go anywhere. And of course, you've got the, the core experience, which is all of Open Bazaar. And I think the, the one technical aspect, if I can geek out for a second, is that we have all of the Open Bazaar server code, the, the actual node itself, running on your mobile device. It's not like remoting into some um, infrastructure provision somewhere. No, it's you know your mobile device running an open bazaar node. So the potential here to have millions of people walking around running open bazaar on their iOS device or Android device, connecting with each other directly, um, you know, chatting privately, doing trade, buying and selling things, speaking. Um, it is is just super exciting. So uh, we we can't wait to release it to the world. We really think that this is going to be the answer when people say, okay, so what do I do with my Bitcoin? What do I do with my Litecoin? What do I do with my Zcash? Well, this will be it. You take it to to Haven and uh, you go to town. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan here? I mean, so this is a. It sounds like a great idea, but as as uh, as Brian mentioned earlier, like the goal is to is to get this into the hands of people outside the crypto space. And there's a whole ecosystem of, of people and sort of creators and artisans and people who make crafts and, you know, clothing and all this kind of stuff that, and, and that sell these products on platforms like Etsy. And these are massively successful. I think Pinterest yeah. is now getting into this to some extent. Now they have like a marketplace or they're thinking about it. And then, you know, eBay, obviously, um, these platforms are massively successful. There are millions of people here. People have businesses there. There's all kinds of transactions occurring there. What's the incentive for them, you know, beyond sort of the privacy aspect, of course, um, what's the incentive to use something like Haven? How is this going to become successful, essentially? How you plan to do that? Well, I think in terms of incentive, there's obviously the financial incentive. There are no transaction fees, there are no listing fees, there are no platform fees at all. So you're not going to have an eBay taking a 10% plus or minus 20 uh, cut on every transaction that you make on the network. There's not the risk that the platform will suddenly turn around and say, all right, we're going to start charging you fees for this, that, and the other. Um, uh, the other incentive, I think, is the the risk for deplatforming is eliminated because um, you know you can't be deplatformed off Open Bazaar. Yeah, a, a search index might not pick you up, but it fundamentally doesn't remove you from the network. You can still be accessed. You can still be reached out to. People can still place orders with you. Uh, and I think the privacy aspect is is not to be underestimated, especially you know in recent years where we've seen. Um, you know, abuses of, of privacy of customers and people feeling that, you know, it's not okay that these large platforms have deep insights into what I buy and what I sell. And uh, I mean, we even heard um, recently that Amazon is charging 
different prices to different people based on their purchase history. So they know if they're a little bit, a little bit more affluent, they're going to bump up the price. Or right. if they're, so, but, you know, all, all of these things don't happen on Open Bazaar. The, the, this is true. And I, I, I'm fully on board and I fully agree with, with the fact that companies like Amazon are, are transgressing, you know, are, are going beyond some, some lines. Or they're crossing some lines with regards to you know, their users' privacy. And, you know, I, I personally try to use them as little as possible. And I buy things locally as much as I can. And I've re really reduced my dependency on Amazon a lot in this last year or so um, as sort of a personal goal. Um, but I, I, it feels like your, your, your customer base, or at least the merchants, are not typically like, Merchants that you'd find on Amazon, they're they're more like you know artists. If I, if I'm looking at sort of the 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 listings on on Open Bazaar today, you know you've got one guy who makes like this beautiful wooden uh, artwork. You know it, it's more like the the, the types yeah. of folks that you'd find on Etsy or these other marketplaces. And I don't think that these platforms, like no one's pointing the finger at Etsy, saying like, oh Etsy, you guys are you know, this big you know, GAFA type company that are exploiting people and following us on the internet and selling the data to others, et cetera. So uh, uh, on that point, I'd like maybe to, you respond there. On, on, the, um, on the privacy side, I think this is true. I think like people want to have that, um, but that's a small fringe of people. Um, on the deplatforming side uh, argument, I, I don't think most people are concerned with this. I think the people who are concerned with this are probably selling products that are questionable or maybe illicit or maybe that don't appeal to the masses or to everyone. So, yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, I think those those are those are two good points. I think uh, the, to kind of refute that argument that those things are needed. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the the Etsy thing, you know, I mean, I, you know, it could be a reality where. A platform like Open Bazaar is some somewhere people go for more serious purchases, and toilet paper and paper towels is all done on Amazon, and people don't care that you know that I bought toilet paper and toothpaste and toothbrushes, and like maybe that's not the type of platform that Open Bazaar will become, um, you know, and maybe it's more like you know sensitive things that they decide to purchase through op Open Bazaar. Um, but you know, in terms of a small audience, privacy-minded audiences are not small, like. If you look, there was a study that I think DuckDuckGo did recently that looked at the last five years of their growth and the massive amount of increase in adoption of DuckDuckGo as a search engine in terms of privacy because people are more and more freaked out and they're becoming more technically uh, literate and they're moving to these platforms. You have Brave Browser that has over a million downloads now, which I never would have thought of that a year ago. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And what is your marketplace alternative? Where do you go to do private shopping? I mean, you can go to independent websites, but that doesn't provide the same kind of experience as a truly global marketplace. And secondly, you're talking about exposure across the, the planet. I mean, you go to Amazon, you're not buying, you're not buying stuff from people in South America. You're not buying stuff from people in Africa. You're not buying stuff from people, all of these different economies that could expand and grow if they just had the ability to have that, you know, reach that global reach, you know, all these different Amazon platforms are all siloed into the, you know, Mercado Libre and you have, you know, now you have Alibaba over and, you know, the East and all these different things, they're all separate. Open Bazaar has the ability to destroy those barriers. I mean, you download the app in, in, you know, Argentina, you could sell your products right off your Android phone directly to someone else. Now, logistically, maybe it's not there, you know, shipping and whatever, but it could start out as digital goods or services, cross-border services. It could be trading, it, you know, it could be all these different things. I mean, why is an artist not able to sell a PDF? you know, or a, a graphic service through Open Bazaar, you know, using crypto, and, and he's not paying any cross-border fees or transaction fees, any of that stuff. I mean, with the mobile app, that opens up a whole new possibility. We did a pilot in Argentina uh, several months back, and, it, and it, it wasn't really great, but it was, you know, in terms of adoption, but it was very enlightening. I mean, they had to set up the desktop app in a, in a computer center. People had to come to the computer center and be trained to use it, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, imagine how that changes when they can just download it from the app store onto their Android device and just run it right there. I mean, it's just completely different experience. 
and they can start selling, you know, to Americans or whatever. And there's no restrictions there. Now, the App Store also, <laughs> there's there's a little bit of a, you know, we, we haven't gone through that battle yet, but, you know, th- theoretically, it, it is a game changer for us. I don't dispute the fact that it's it's valuable and useful. It's just, um, I, I really want to see these applications take off. And I'm I'm still I'm still myself looking at these and saying like what's what's the use case like where's the use case that really takes the th- this thing and catapults it into mainstream adoption and maybe you know these these markets like Argentina and like these places where cross border payments are not so simple maybe that's a, a good place for these things to emerge from um, but yeah we'll we'll see but um, when when is the app com- coming up? Uh, we don't have a firm date yet, but we're getting towards the end of it. There's only a little bit left uh, really to do before we get it out into testers' hands and and start rolling it out. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's great to be, have a healthy skepticism over this. I think we've been doing this long enough to know that this is not going to be an overnight thing, right? Like we've been in this for over four years now. It is not something that you know, we wake up the next morning, we're like, today's the day. You know, I, I don't know. Um, you know, most like big successes, there was kind of one thing that kicked it off and then it just kind of snowballed from there. And we don't know what that will be. I'm as curious as you so- sound <laughs> as to what that will be. I mean, the only thing we can do is try and get our user experience as close to parity with, with our competitors as possible and hope people start to see that the, the you know, the, you know, the pros beyond it that you get from using cryptography and privacy minded applications will override in the end. So it's definitely an uphill battle and, you know, we're preparing for the worst in terms of that battle. So, uh, yeah. I think the one thing that works to our advantage though, is that sellers on these marketplaces aren't afraid to try different platforms and to expand. I mean, I don't think it's a case where, we turn to a seller who's on Etsy and say, you know, screw Etsy, you need to come over to us and shut down all of your stores. It's, it's more like inviting them to spread their footprint onto now a decentralized marketplace and get a whole bunch of interest and focused attention from an ecosystem that is eager to make another economy in real world goods and services using crypto. So I, I think that, that, that that's one thing we're looking forward to. Yeah, and and I, just one more point on the deplatforming though. You kind of made it sound like it was a fringe thing, right? Like the deplatforming. Oh, it only affects like Milo Yiannopoulos and you know these these a holes that are probably don't deserve to be on these platforms at all anyway. But what you have to realize is that if this is a platform that they can come to and use as a so-called safe haven from those deplatform risks, they have millions and millions and millions of followers. <laughs> that will listen to them and they will do and they will be influenced by that. And those people will come over and perhaps they're not the ones that are instigating all this. But, you know, that's a huge amount of audience that you potentially lose out on. So it's it's kind of a double edged sword. You may you may have a situation where people, you know, you let people onto your platform that a lot don't agree with. But they ha- you can't deny that they have huge and massive audiences that that may may come over and become users. Well, I, I look forward to seeing Alex Jones selling tinfoil hats on Open Bazaar. <laughs> oh, he's weird, but he's entertaining, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, just before we wrap up, so I did want to ask you this and forgot to ask during the show, is, but what is the, the business model for the, the, the parent company, Obi-Wan? It's a work in progress. I mean, real, in reality, uh, we're a decentralized company in centralized clothing uh, and you know, we have to figure out what is the right model. And right now we're approaching it from two angles. One is, you know, the token that we talked about that we plan to release in the future is, is something that we will consider as equity for our business as well and, and have ownership over, you know, a portion of it and and try to derive value for for users, you know, and, and grow that organically. So, you know, the token is not a sale. It, it will come out and it will have no value essentially. And we will hope to grow that over time and make that a valuable asset. And in, on, and on the traditional side, we will be exploring, you know, normal things like Etsy and, and uh, the others do, which is, you know, allow people to promote their listings and products and services to others uh, in, in, for compensation and also providing value added services. Like for instance, you know, 
maybe you want someone to give you secure backup for your merchant store, you know, in case your device fails or something, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like in-app purchases, things like that. Just traditional revenue streams. So we're trying to explore both of those, but the only, you know, one fact remains that neither of those succeed unless there's scale. So right now we're focused on building the platform and making sure that people can use it and want to use it. And that continues to grow. So, uh, kind of a, a no answer, but we're figuring it out is, is really what's going on. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks so much to both of you for coming on. Uh, it was great to, uh, have, have open bazaar on again. It's, it's not often that we, we have, we do repeat shows about, uh, about topics, but, uh, but what we do, it's because they've been along, they've been along long enough for, you know, sufficient things to have happened. So congratulations <laughs> for having stuck around this long to be on Epicenter twice. <laughs> congratulations for not being dead. Okay, good. Well, we hope to see you in uh, 2023. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope we'll still be here in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, a guest, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.